Hi, this is Jenna. And this is Kelly. And you're listening to ODFM. This episode is one derailment from murder. done automobiles i've done automobiles <laughs> I, I did a plane now we're on to yeah. train yeah so here's yeah. the trifecta <laughs> yeah yeah all right so <laughs> have you ever been on one of those passenger trains where you sleep on it no i've, I've always that, wanted to do that right it seems cool and creepy at the same time totally but i've always wanted to go where they look like on the movies they have different cars for eating and different cars yeah. for like a bar I yes. so badly want to do that. Yes. My only worry was like, you know, like if I was like on the top bunk and like, oh, right. like jolted and I like rolled out. Like yeah. Was... <laughs> Maybe you could get strapped in like a seatbelt. <laughs> like a straight jacket. <laughs> it's cool. I'll just, I have one at home. I could bring it. It's fine. I'll it's just cool. bring my straight jacket. My but then it, it's tough when you need to pee. I don't know. You know. <laughs> Especially when you're on the top bunk. Yeah. Oh something. God. Just don't drink anything. Yeah. <laughs> So, but after this, I don't know how I feel about stigma, a passenger train, but. Oh, this is going to be good. Okay. Okay. So this happens on the night of October 9th of 1995. So it wasn't all that long ago. October 9th? October 9th. (laughs) This could have been a birthday episode, right? This could have been a birthday episode. (laughs) Okay. So, all right. All right. I'm trying to think of what I was doing on the birthday in 95. 95. You would have been in college, so. Right. I was Excellent. drunk then. I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's no way to know. <laughs> no. This night, Jenna was drunk somewhere on the streets of Chicago. Exactly. Yes. And also, this was at 1.30 a.m. So you might have been passed out by that point. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. been ex- oh, ex- but- asked to leave the building. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> you need to take her home. <laughs> Probably. Okay. So it's 1.30 a.m. Neil Halford was jolted awake by a horrific sound, which you don't ever want to be. Uh, no. no matter where you are. No matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're on a train, plane, automobile, in your own freaking bed. Right. A really loud shriek followed by a massive impact slammed Neil into the seat in front of him. Ooh. The, then the lights went out in the passenger train car he was riding in. Oh. <sighs> Wouldn't that freak you the fuck out? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Neil had boarded the Sunset Limited two days before in San Antonio. And it would have been much faster to fly to San Diego, where his then girlfriend lived, but he opted to take the train instead, because at this time he'd been dealing with the fear of flying, so he felt safer taking the train. <laughs> How'd that work out for him? <laughs> I know. Reminds me of that Alanis Morissette song. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my God. Exactly. Where the guy waits forever for, and then Wait, his flight. Yeah. How do you feel now? How, yeah. How do you like in those trains? <laughs> I know. Poor guy. So far, so the train ride so far had been uneventful except for a crying baby in the nearby compartment, which made it tough to sleep. But shortly after midnight, he had finally drifted off. At about 1.30 a.m., a loud crashing sound jolted Neil awake as he was thrown into the seat in front of him, like I said earlier. His dinner tray table was still down and it jammed into his ribs. Ah, so his must have been a seat, you know, it wasn't like a bed. Yeah, he didn't get... Yeah, I must not have paid for the... He didn't pay to actually get to lay down. Yeah, you got to sit up. Yeah, you got to pay extra to lay down. You're going to have to sit. You can recline slightly. Yeah, probably. That's it. That that half an inch or whatever right, that exactly. it is. Oh, so relaxing. Right. Oh, God. Okay, so the train had come to a screeching halt and the cars had gone pitch black. Passengers would later learn that the engine had separated from the rest of the compartments. Oh, that's a problem. I know, right? I guess we're not going anywhere. At this point, though, Neil could only hear other riders shouting through the dark, trying to figure out what happened. Oh, God, that type of thing. I don't know. It just freaking scares me. They the don't have, of, like, emergency lights or anything like that? Nothing. Like, Apparently, since they're not hooked up to the engine, I think that has oh, all the hell? power. Mm-hmm. Isn't that freaky? I'm sure people don't just have flashlights on them and stuff. Right. Like, Possibly. Maybe the the attendants, what would you call them? The stewards? Maybe they would. Yes. Yeah. Stewards. I like, uh, yeah. Yeah. As they sat in the dark, Neil and the other passengers near the rear of the train had not yet seen the scene that was splayed across the desert gulch ahead. 
a train attendant eventually appeared and told them that the train had derailed and asked everybody to stay calm and stay inside, which, yeah, okay. I guess we'll just sit here in the pitch black dark and hope we don't die somehow. I don't know. (laughs) Jeez. So for about 30 minutes after the attendant left, passengers did as he had asked and they stayed put, but conditions inside the train car quickly became unbearable. They, They were somewhere in the desert of Arizona. And so it's like super hot, even in October. The air conditioning had gone out with the power. Right. And the toilets were no longer flushing. Oh, shit. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Oh, Oh, shit. Uh, So uh, I can't even imagine. This is going to be bad. (laughs) Black kids. People are probably screaming and freaking out. I just know. Neil couldn't stand it anymore. So he left the train car to step outside for some fresh air. But he wasn't prepared for what he would witness in the dark night. Eight passenger cars had derailed four of which fell off a bridge and into a dry <gasps> riverbed. Isn't that horrifying? Can you imagine being on that? Whew. Amtrak Sunset Limited passenger train had jumped the track going 50 miles per hour. The four cars that fell off the bridge had plunged more than 30 feet to the dry ground below, but only one person was killed while scores of others, like hundreds of others, were injured. Wow. Only one person? Only died? one person. So it wasn't terrible, but the derailment was no accident. I'm picturing like Wiley e. Coyote tied to the track. Right? <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Oh, or all those like, old black is... and whites where they tie the woman down and she's like, <laughs> oh, oh. this is my frame yeah. of knowledge when yes. it comes to trains and derailments. <laughs> it's black so and true. white movies and Warner yeah. Brothers. <laughs> totally. Bugs Bunny. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Brian Hamlet, Hamlet. It's H-A-M-B-L-E-T, so maybe it's a so silent, it's a silent B. B. <laughs> Hamblet. Blet. Hamblet. Hamblet. Another passenger was inside a train car with his wife, the train quietly clacking along when the car they were in lifted and started to slowly tilt sideways, then quickly dropped. Ooh, all around him, Brian heard people screaming. Can you imagine? No, I, I, I cannot. It's given me chills, the thought of... Having to sit through that. Oof. I don't know that I'll ever ride a train again. I know. <laughs> I know. Here's a quote from Brian. Everyone was waking up and realizing what was going on as we were falling, he says. I remember screaming to my wife and my wife screaming back. And as it turned out, we were both fine. So that's good. But they climbed up and into the other compartments to escape through the window. And then they went back to help the other injured to get out. Oh, my God. Oh, it'd be so freaking scary. So Betty Addington, who was 60 of Dallas, and she was traveling with her 80-year-old mother to visit her sister in Los Angeles, were on the train. Betty said, quote, I heard babies screaming and their mother was hollering each one of their names, one after the other, trying to find her babies. Oh, God, can you imagine? I know. No. no. <sighs> I'd be freaking wow. out. Meanwhile, in the nearby town of Buckeye, Arizona, Patricia Boree was the lone police dispatcher on duty working an ordinary night. Oh, You'd think. Her I know. night was about to go to shit. Yeah, poor <laughs> Patricia. We're like, oh, girl. So here's a quote from her. She says, the graveyard shift is the quietest. Just a few traffic stops and maybe a beer run here or there, you know? <laughs> Maybe a beer run. <laughs> like, I'm like, are you beer running? Or is Fish this girl, like... this is about to get real. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Or do people call into 911 for a beer run? They're like, I ran out of beer. I have an emergency. emergency. <laughs> you don't understand. We're out of beer. <laughs> so I was like trying to just interpret that. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? It, like oh a beer God. run. Or maybe <laughs> while you're working, it's okay to have beer. I don't know. While you're dispatching. I thought that was funny. Maybe people, <laughs> people are going to jail for their beer runs. Who knows? But Right. You, you're, you're supposed to send someone sober for your beer run. You're not supposed to go. Right. <laughs> <for yourself>. <laughs> <laughs> She's oh, like, God. I got you, honey. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. Thanks for calling in. You need more beer? You want Pabst? Right. That right. blue ribbon. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, then she got the call that would change the night from ordinary into horror. Pat, this is a little background about Pat. She had moved her family to the small farming community in 1980 when it was a one light town with a population of about 5,000 people. Oh, wow. She was a dispatcher for about 10 years, and the night shift was nothing new to her. 
On this evening, she was training a new dispatcher. That, I know. Oh, boy. Oh, babe. You sure you want to be a dispatcher? You want to be training. <laughs> oh, my God. First day on the job. This is going to be exciting. Is this what it's always like? Yeah. Oh, my God. I don't think I want to do this job. Right, exactly. The most eventful calls to come in at that point were usually about barking dogs, which I've never called 911 about a barking dog before. No. But I haven't called for beer either. Is true. <laughs> maybe I'm doing it wrong. Right? I, didn't I know, am not maybe utilizing I... this service. Yes, that's, full that's, what I, that's what I was starting to think. Like, maybe I've, I've, I didn't realize that this was a full service thing. <laughs> I thought it was just for really, really big emergencies. Right. Um, the other thing they usually got was people having heart attacks, which, you know, that makes sense. Okay. But on the clear night of October 9th, she got the call that a train had derailed. And a lot of people had heart attacks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Everyone's like, what? Right, exactly. Uh-uh. The location was unclear. Maybe somewhere near Tanopa was the only information she could come up with. Really? Yeah. Isn't that creepy? I think it's just so far out of any area. Are there a lot of bridges that they could possibly have fallen right. over? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. I'd be maybe. like, well, we're, we're, we're nearby and we went over a bridge. <laughs> Got it. Got it. All I right. know you are. We're somewhere in Arizona in the desert. <laughs> right? I don't know. Okay. All of the firefighters and paramedics at the time were volunteer. So oh, she had God. to put a call out for them to respond. So yeah, it takes a while. You know, then what they if all they were on a beer run. They, <laughs> they might have been on the beer run. What do you do? They were like, excuse you, I'm just getting Deborah's Pabst. I what? haven't delivered it yet. <laughs> How does that work when you're just a volunteer? What if you have a prior engagement? Do you just hope the other volunteers come through? How it's does that crazy. Work? So I have friends, they only have a volunteer fire department in Buffalo, in my hometown. Okay. As far as I know. And so I have friends that work it. And so they are on call for those nights. So they have to take their walkie talkies or whatever they use these days. It's probably not a walkie talkie. They don't have their pagers anymore. They don't have their beepers. 911. They beat me 911. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they actually take their cell phones and that works as their pager. That could probably be it. But yeah. So those people are on call. So they know they could get called out at any time. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So then they have to go either straight to the fire department i think to get dressed and then they go there but i mean that's still an added few minutes for sure her. yeah pat said this was the first time paging out all of the fire departments at one time they all thought i lost my mind <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how many fire how departments big is this like, beer run? Right. <laughs> they're all Are like getting kegs what's <laughs> happening <laughs> why why is this such a big deal Ah, she also said it was just calling on farmers and other agencies. She remembered we contacted every ambulance company in the Phoenix metropolitan area because at that point we still didn't know how many people would need to be transported. And that was what was really amazing about the whole incident because the whole town just came together on that. So, I mean, they were pulling from Phoenix, which I'm not even sure how far that was. I think I read maybe 45 minutes from this thing. Oh, my God. And their own little town. And they're even calling farmers to try to help from around the area. Wow. Oh, my God. Responders were all driving off road to make it to the scene through dried up riverbeds through the desert. And when it became clear how inaccessible the crash site was, Pat, the dispatcher, dialed Buckeye Farmers with special grading equipment, wondering if they could grade makeshift roads to reach the train. Because Holy crap. there were they no to roads out to it. Build a way for them to get oh yeah, she even began securing the aid of local airfields to fuel helicopters wow. to go out to the place. Yeah. In fact, much of the rescue effort involved helicopters and all-terrain vehicles because the rugged area was so remote. Sheriff Arpaio, which doesn't that sound like something like a TV show sheriff? I swear. It sheriff sounds so Arpaio? perfect. Yeah, it sounds so perfect for Arizona. I'm um, Sheriff Arpaio. I don't know. Well, sure, if you do it with the accent, yeah. Right, yeah. Now it, it's totally reasonable now. <laughs> now it's completely reasonable. So Sheriff Arpaio said the rescue effort included 25 helicopters from various agencies, including the Marines and the Air Force. Which is crazy. So they sent oh them out from everywhere. Pierce Aviation, a tiny airstrip nearby, volunteered to open as a refueling spot for helicopters. The Critical Incident Command Center from Luke Air Force Base set up a triage center at the Drailman site. So even the Air Force Base was coming out. Wow. The area was so remote that firemen had to be stationed along the way to direct ambulances in the dark since there was no road. They're like, oh, my God, you could drive off anywhere into the desert and end up in Mexico. So (laughs) it's like in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. And it's 
It's pitch, pitch black. black. Ugh. Teams worked through the night, setting up lights along the crash to help workers see in the inky black night. Inky. Inky. Inky blinky. <laughs> what, weren't their names? Uh, so the ghosts from Pac-Man? Yes. Inky, inky blinky. blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. <laughs> was it? Because I watched, um, what's that movie? My kids love that movie. Pixels. Oh, yes. Adam Sandler. I think we have that somewhere. And Clyde. It's Mm -hmm. a good movie. It is a good movie. I thought it was going to suck. I remember going to the movie theater with them and I was like, oh, this is going to suck. And it was actually really good. Yes. I remember. We own it now. Pat, the dispatcher, she worked through the night as rescue vehicles came rolling in by the dozens. She was supposed to get off work at 6 a.m. but ended up staying until 11. So, you oh, know, yeah. <laughs> a.m. or p.m. Because I, <laughs> yes, I know, till right. Till the I next. Mean... Well, she had just collapsed into her bed after getting off at 11 when she got a call from the police chief asking her to go back to the station for an interview with the L.A. Times. Because, you know, because <laughs> the Times can't wait for her to take. Right. A I was Jeez. like, yes, <laughs> isn't that important? <laughs> Why don't you do the interview? <laughs> exactly. Oh, but back at the crash site, Neil had stepped outside for a breath of fresh air. So this is the guy who uh, had flown into the seat in front of him with the tray table down. Yes. And, and he so he had stepped outside. The with yes. The non-working. Oh, God. Yeah. No. Oh, so he saw not just the disaster in the ravine below, but he also noticed something out of place in the dusty desert. About 12 feet from the rail... Under the light of the moon, he spotted a piece of paper under a rock. And Neil said, I wasn't thinking anything sinister at the time. I was just thinking, this is a little odd for this Mm -hmm. piece of paper just to be lying out here out in the middle of nowhere. Which you would. So he took the note out from under the rock and glanced over the typewritten message. So he must have had enough light to actually see that. So it must not have been like, like cave dark. Well, maybe it wasn't as dark by this point. Was it like? That could be. Like it might Maybe be the like the sun started to. I don't yeah, know. Could be. He said, "I read the first two or three lines of what's in this note, and I go, oh my god." He said, "I'm holding a note from people who intentionally just tried to kill everybody on this train." What? Mm-hmm. Today's episode is presented by The Skin Store. For over 20 years, The Skin Store has been the number one destination for premium skincare, hair care, and beauty products. With over 8,000 different products from 300 different brands, The Skin Store has you covered for all your hair, cosmetics, supplements, and of course, skincare needs. Find your favorite brands like Elta MD, New Face, Olaplex, and more, all in one place with gifts for every purchase. Right now, The Skin Store is offering our listeners 20% off your next purchase by using the code POD. That's code P-O-D for 20% off your next purchase at skinstore.com slash pod dot list. Skin Store, have the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Exclusions apply. Wiley Coyote never left a note. I'm just <laughs> he never saying. left notes. <laughs> never no. Left a note. Yeah, you, you don't <laughs> usually leave a note, but these people want, wanted everyone to know. So we left off with Neil having just read a note he found under a rock near the rail. It was not from Acme. That was not <laughs> from the Acme Association. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> from Wiley Coyote. <laughs> Michelle Cruz, who was 29 at the time, was also a passenger on the train. She had walked along the tracks after the crash, getting fresh air, much like Neil, because everyone's probably like, God, it smells like shit in here. I'm out. Right. How long are you going to sit in a crash train? Like, <laughs> I know, right? We should right. probably get out of here. She came across a man with a red beard and a mustache, guarding a note on the ground under a rock. He's a leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's Ooh, not where I went with it, but okay. <laughs> give me a limerick and I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Uh, so. <laughs> you don't, nobody steals my lucky charms <laughs> sorry I went, I'm off on this leprechaun tangent uh, I think you've lost it <laughs> probably okay so at this point it was still pretty early in the morning and the sun had yet to come up she had a flashlight this Michelle Cruz so she shined it on the note and knelt down next to it but she didn't touch it not wanting to put fingerprints on it because he had already kind of told her this guy that was, um, I'm not sure if this was Neil or somebody else. Maybe Neil's oh. the leprechaun, but. <laughs> He's the leprechaun. Right. <laughs> Somebody's guarding this note. 
She said, quote, it started out as something like you read in a book, how people are victimized, something about as lights go down in the night, the mothers and daughters begin to pray, possibly kneel to pray, she said. So some weird reference in the note. Okay. And she recalled a reference to the FBI disconnecting the power or refusing to turn it on, saying something about the electricity not being on and praying in the dark. So she was just confused. She said they were trying to be like poetic martyrs victimized by the FBI and different government agencies. So this is in, all in the note these people left. Okay. She said, I believe they're trying to be sarcastically poetic, which I, I really want to know exactly what the note says. So that would be like, yeah, what are you talking how about? How are you sarcastically? It does sound like a leprechaun li- limerick or something. I don't know. I'm picturing like Shel Silverstein. Like I'm trying yes. to understand what is <laughs> what sarcastically... sarcastically poetic. Okay. I don't know. Like being angry at the FBI. So the biggest impression on me, she said, it was like it was brand new, the paper. Oh, it didn't look like it had okay. been thrown around in the desert. Because when you first said it, I was picturing like, so like in the crash, did like something fly out mm-hmm. the window and then a rock fell on it? Right. That would be kind of <laughs> odd, but. So it's pristine. But Neil, that the leprechaun or somebody else. <laughs> the leprechaun. <laughs> Neil the leprechaun. <laughs> he ultimately discovered two more notes under rocks around the crash site, which he reported to authorities that day. Who's going around leaving notes in the desert? I know. I know. Odd. Isn't it? And investigators reportedly found two additional notes. So like four, three they or four. They really of them. wanted to be sure everyone found the notes. They were like, "Is it, if a big breeze comes up and right. blows one of these away. You better have a backup. Yeah, just Maybe in case. Maybe we should have a backup to the backup. <laughs> we should have a backup to the backup to the backup. Maybe just one more. Like, <laughs> Plan A, B, C, D. Oh my God. Someone's a little OCD here. Yes. I like, really want totally. to make sure they get this note. They want to make sure people read their shit. <laughs> Larry McCormick, retired Phoenix FBI agent, arrived on the scene. He said, in 30 years in the FBI, I worked a lot of high-level cases. He was quoted as saying he worked the Jimmy Hoffa case, the Oklahoma City bombing case, Ooh. which happened not that long before this one. Oh, right. Okay. Because 95, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. But this one, he said, was unique. Even over those, which shocked me because like those are huge, <laughs> especially the right. Oklahoma City bombing. Holy shit. Wow. The mysterious notes left at the scene were left by someone who claimed to be part of a group called the Sons of the Gestapo. <laughs> With- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Like, we're talking Nazis then? What? I'm so confused. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Sons of the Gestapo, which, you know, like there's Daughters of the Revolution and things like that. But Sons of the Gestapo, that's like a Nazi thing. We're not in Germany. What? What is happening? I don't know. But (laughs) the Sons of the Gestapo, who referred to the federal authorities' deadly siege against the Branch Davidian sect near Waco, Texas in 1993. Do you remember them? That whole? Yes. Yes. And I remember the ne- it very well because I just watched the Netflix thing oh, a couple months ago, too. Did you? Yes. David, what was the guy's name? David something? Koresh. Koresh, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. And the 1992 confrontation between the FBI and the white separatist Randall Weaver at Ruby Ridge in the Idaho Mountains. So they had, had that big standoff. You know, right. It was because, like at a cabin in the woods. Mm-hmm. Was that it? Something okay. like that. Or they had a, didn't they have like a, a huge cache of weapons Kind of making a compound or something. Of course, I might yes. be thinking of the Montana one. But yeah, th- so those all, there were a lot of those going on at that time. It's kind it of was bizarre. A freaky. Kind of all these militia groups. These guys are, are talking about how they are not supporting the FBI because of the things they did at those events. Like they're okay. super anti-FBI and government. So I don't know why they're tracking this train, mm. but Amtac, 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 Amtac. Amtac. That sounds like a new type of tic tac. <laughs> <Amtac. laughs> or, or maybe a heartburn something. I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, I have a little heartburn. Yeah, you know that Amtac? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me get it. Okay, so Amtrak executives said that that derailment was an act of sabotage that could have taken one person only 10 minutes to carry out. It can only take 10 minutes to derail an entire train? I feel like it should be harder than that. Yeah, exactly. So that was like a big heads up to like, okay, something needs to change at this point. I still don't understand how you derail a train. Like, Ooh. aren't they like... Right. I, don't, I guess well, I don't know how... they describe it here in oh, a good, minute. Oh, good, because I'm yes. trying to understand this. I know. Okay. How do you do it? At a news conference in Washington, the president and chairman of Amtrak, Thomas 
M. Downs said the derailment had been caused by the removal of bolts that held a 36-inch long connecting bar to two pieces of 39-foot long rail. The removal of the bar, called a joint, would have normally caused the train to stop well before the brake because it would have interrupted an electric current flowing through that and other such joints at a series of red and green signals situated along the tracks. And the signals, and I've, I'm sure you've seen those before too, they alert a train's engineer to rails that have come apart during a flood, a rock fall, or other natural disturbances. Oh, okay. So they know long in advance to stop. Gotcha. But whoever had removed the joint knew enough about the system to attach a wire to each end of the rails on either side so the joint didn't lose their electric current. <gasps> oh. Yes. So the train's engineer would still continue to see green lights and not know there was any problem ahead. This was not a half-assed job. No. They knew something about the rail. So Mr. Down said someone obviously intended to have the train drop off the ravine without any precautions. They could have easily killed a much larger number of passengers. I just well, who it, would have seen anybody do anything if they're out in the middle yeah, of nowhere? Middle of nowhere. And it's also so hard to find. They would have to know possibly where these train tracks are. Right. The FBI believes that they picked up that particular spot in order to create the most damage and possibly cause the most injuries or death. The train was going about 50 miles per hour. It's on a curve and it occurred right before a trestle bridge. So like a super dangerous spot. Yeah, they picked the, the right spot. Wow. The sabotage tracks were among the least traveled in the nation's railway system. So that's also kind of like, what? Why pick? The, but maybe because it's so far out in the desert and they thought they wouldn't be seen then right it'd be less noticeable or maybe they could do it since it's not used a lot they could do it far in advance or something yeah that could be yeah and so um the previous train passed over that stretch of track 18 hours earlier so they had 18 hours to oh yeah yeah yeah. so maybe that's why Investigators could not rule out the possibility that the sabotage was carried out by a person with a grudge against Amtrak, Southern Pacific, or an associated business. And employment records were combed for possible leads, of course. Because you kind of wonder, well, they know a lot about trains. I don't know. Sheriff Joe Arpaio said that his deputies had picked up two men near the crash in question. Um, But he said, we do not believe they're connected to the crash. They were curious as to what was going on. So they saw all the lights and all these people heading out into the desert. So they grabbed their papst. And- they- <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, he not said- over. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, he said he did not release the men's names, but said they were in their 20s and had apparently been drinking that night in Phoenix. <laughs> they were on their way back. From the- <laughs> yeah. Well, we had to go get our own beer because there was yeah. nobody left around to do our beer run for us. So. Like, so we had to go to Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and it does say here Phoenix was about 40 miles northeast. And they had oh, decided man. to drive into the desert to drink, I think. And then they were drawn <laughs> to the area of the crash by the commotion. Yeah, and usually there's nothing out there. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? Uh, I know. So after flying over the crash in a helicopter and being briefed by investigators, Governor Fife Symington... Fife. That's an interesting Fife. first name. Like yeah. Barney Fife? <gasps> it is. It's like Barney but Fife, his but it's his first name. Yeah. Um, Fife Simmons. I don't know how I'd feel if my parents named me after Barney Fife. I know. <laughs> I guess it's better than Barney. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, but that's specifically after that Barney. So, <laughs> True. I mean, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's sorry. A purple dinosaur. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Governor Fife Symington said, this was well planned. The people who did this knew very well what they were doing. It was very professional. Sounds Um, like it. Yeah, it does. Investigators soon discovered many similarities to another act of sabotage more than a half of a century before. So according to historian Kevin Bunker, in 1939, 24 people were killed and 117 people injured in another suspicious train whack. Whack. Wreck. (laughs) Train whack. (laughs) I hate those train wax in the uh, Nevada desert. And he, here's a quote from Kevin, the uh, historian. The historian, okay. He says, the most mysterious connection between the accidents is the fact that the sabotage was done ahead of a bridge in a desert country of remote location. There was definitely care in advance, you know, that the wires were intact at all times. Merely moving one piece of metal, in this case, one rail, a matter of less than four inches, allowed both trains to careen off the curve as they crossed the river and the damage occurred. Like, 
Isn't that crazy? That's all it takes. <gasps> Throw that whole thing off. It's kind of freaky. Yeah. So maybe they knew about the other accident and they thought we could do yeah. something like that. In fact, curiously, the story of the 1939 crash had been published in a journal for train buffs shortly before the Amtrak accident. Oh! And federal agents questioned many of the readers of those, but came up up empty-handed. I don't know if it was like people who checked out the publication from libraries or where they were getting, you know, how they figured out who read them. Mm -hmm. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, Clan Watch, an organization that tracks hate groups as part of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, had never heard of the Sons of Gestapo, (laughs) as all of us. Right, the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. they said it could be some kind of local group or, quote, this could be Fred the Farmer, who's mad at Amtrak for cutting across his land. (laughs) They're not wrong. no. (laughs) I'm going to call my chef to shun to the stables. God damn Amtrak. I'm good at being Fred the Farmer. You are. They also said it very well could be some disgruntled individual who's trying to blame it on the militias. Just to get it in the news. So the sabotage occurred on a portion of tracks owned by Southern Pacific Railroad, which at that time was expected to merge with Union Pacific, resulting in an estimated $500 million in annual savings through cost cutting and job reductions. (gasps) Ooh. Yeah. I smell motive. I know. Doesn't that seem like a good motive? The two lines did end up merging in 1996, but this was just before their merger. So a lot of people were set to lose jobs. (laughs) Also, prior to this incident, other people, everybody, nobody had ever heard of the Sons of Gestapo. (laughs) And and no one has heard of them since. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's been a continuing mystery and a continuing question about whether this was a political attack on the government or whether, in fact, it was just some disgruntled, angry or psychotic person out there like Fred the Farmer. (laughs) I have never heard this case. No. Or of that group. Uh, Isn't it crazy? In 20 years, authorities also have never linked the Amtrak derailment with any other terrorist attack. The FBI's head agent on the case today said that even today, the crash site is extremely isolated. Like still to this day, how many years? 20 years later. There's no roads. Right. Whoever accessed it likely was familiar with the area. Agent uh, Lum said, it's one of those places that if you don't know how to get there, you'd get lost. It truly is. It's in the middle of nowhere even today. So it's like you could drive off in the desert and maybe never make it back, you know. (laughs) Nowadays, driving to the crash site from Buckeye, where Pat, the dispatcher, lived, would take about an hour. And that's on much improved roads. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, still super far out in the middle of nowhere. Just a couple days after the derailment, FBI agents in Phoenix reported finding a device capable of derailing a train on a set of railroad tracks near Union Station in downtown Phoenix. The device, which is made of two heavy pieces of metal with a hinge in between, was placed over a track in such a way that it would have derailed a train if one had come by. I don't don't even know how that would work. I don't either. But the so-called derailer is used normally to get trains back on tracks But it can also do the opposite and take trains off of tracks. Oh. Kind of crazy. I had no idea that it was that easy. I am seriously going to reconsider any time I need to take a train from now on. I know, right? Oh, the device was found by Phoenix police after a truck driver reported two people making clanging noises on the tracks. So thank God. People were making noises? Yeah. He noticed people out there. I don't know if he was parked, maybe. And he was hearing clanging and then he saw people on the tracks and he was like, oh, something. Okay, that makes more sense. I'm picturing two people on the tracks just loudly screaming, clang, clang, clang. And I'm like, that's, that's <laughs> that doesn't work. Clang. Not- well, and it was just a couple of days after the derailment. So people's, you know, uh, people were on guard after. Right. So they're that. like, that's weird. Okay. Yeah. So thank God he called it in. One possible suspect in the case was John Olin. He was a 32-year-old contractor who had done cleanup work for Southern Pacific Lines in the years prior to the derailment. 
He previously had disputes with two railroads, and he was also known as hot-tempered, belligerent, and abrasive. Which you know, oh, are all such combo. great characteristics to have. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh. She put that in his dating profile. Oh, <laughs> good idea. And probably his resume as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Two people had even asked for restraining orders against him. Oh, God. Yeah, he's a fun guy. Allegedly, he bragged that he could have done the derailment and had the means to do it. Which, you know, okay, we're going to look at this guy. So he also lived in Hyder, yeah. which is a town near the derailment site, for about a year and previously worked there. Oh. He had previously served time for burglary and had also faced murder and robbery charges in the past. This guy is aces. I, I love him. He's he fantastic. Is great. I mean, I, I kind of think we should probably follow him to find out what murder stories we can pick up after. That's Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Follow this guy. Yeah, follow this guy. Or don't. Maybe stay away from this guy. Or maybe stay away from this guy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Asked if he derailed the train, Olin angrily responded, no, I didn't do it. I've never been to that area in my life. Well, okay. Thank you for that. And we won't be talking to you anymore. That's all we needed. I've never (laughs) been there. He shares a rented home 40 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles with a girlfriend and her young child, according to the FBI and his lawyer. His lawyer said, quote, he's a suspect, as is anybody who ever worked on the railroads. Okay, like, so he's thanks, no man. different than anyone else. Okay. Right. I mean, he kind of has a, an MO, though, yo. Yeah. And get this. So a railroad crossing sign adorned the front gate of his home. This is Olin's home, the guy who... That's a train at. enthusiast. Yes. <laughs> Does he have a subscription to that? No, uh, right. The Whatever that publication, publication? was. Mm-hmm. And the pickup truck in his, his driveway had Arizona license plates. And this is in L.A. when he's really? living there. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. The Los Angeles Times quoted a Burlington Northern Santa Fe spokesman as saying that Olin used railroad property, quote, without authorization to dump scrap iron and other recyclables he was ordered to leave afterwards. So he had been the railways. He worked with the railroads. So, and apparently after starting his scrap metal business, Olin spent $4,000 on concrete to build an unloading pad next to railroad tracks, but he hadn't gotten permission from the railroad to build it. And he wasn't given the contract with the railroad to work with them with his business. So he was like, oh, they might want to hire me. So I'm going to pre-make this thing. And then they end up not hiring him to be their scrap metal. Yeah, he's making a lot of assumptions there. So. uh... Mm -hmm. And he wasn't happy about spending that money and then not being picked up and being told to never come back. When you assume, you make an ass of you and me. That's right. People never, never assume. Prior to this incident, Olin was sentenced to six months in jail in 1986 for a home burglary. Prosecutors refused to file charges on a 1988 robbery arrest and a murder charge was dismissed at a 1990 preliminary hearing. Yeah, he's just like any other guy who ever worked on the railroad. Yeah, right, right. Let's not look at this guy. Yeah. He served three years of four-year sentence that he had gotten for a 1990 burglary in L.A. County. Arizona court documents show an assault charge was filed against him in Holbrook, Arizona, then dropped, and two former employees sought orders of protection against him. Oh, boy. But the report didn't say when the events occurred. People who worked with Olin on jobs didn't have kind words for him. (laughs) <laughs> that's so polite i know it's not a nice way was a douche. <laughs> <laughs> i know cindy vanemert said quote he was an awful person he had that attitude like you're just a peon <laughs> he sounds wow bad. uh cindy uh worked for the company that sold olin the concrete for the pad that he had poured without okay. getting permission mm. agents searched olin's home and carted away brown paper bags full of items For weeks, months, and then years, investigators continued to follow any leads that came their way. They looked at all the rail employees and local militia groups, hoping to find the saboteur or saboteurs. And all the way into 2015, the FBI, we're far in the future now, the FBI announced a reward of $310,000 for anyone with information leading to the apprehension of those responsible for the crash. Holy cow. However, nobody has come forward. And I know I read when um, they searched Olin's home, they carted away some items like 
oh, special train equipment. All right. Well, he had equipment that could have derailed the train. That's all I'm saying. Okay. (laughs) He had equipment. You can't do charades on a podcast. (laughs) Uh, So for Neil, we talked about, oh, Mitchell Bates, who was killed. He was the only one killed. Had worked for the railroad for 20 years. I was surprised just because you said there was that one woman that had like her 90-year-old mother. Yeah. She survived. She survived. And a one-year-old. Yeah, I wonder if it was because everyone was mostly sitting down. Maybe that helped them and maybe relaxed because it was middle of the night. So hopefully they're sleeping. Yeah. So, okay. you know. Maybe, I wonder. And he was probably walking around. And oh, God. for okay. Neil, the leprechaun. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> the leprechaun. And his sorry, lucky sorry, Neil. He's probably not the leprechaun. Who knows? But uh, the crash has remained something he has recalled regularly over the past two decades. In 2012, he self-published a book about his experience on the train called the derailment of the sunset limited. He also maintains a Facebook page with any news about the incident, but it has been sparse. Obviously he said, I wish they'd caught somebody. It's just weird and surreal. And that it's gone this long without anything solid and without any suspects arrested. It's kind of crazy. No one's been arrested. No one's been arrested. Not even that Olin dude. They couldn't prove. They didn't get anything off of like the 17 notes that were found in the desert. I know Nothing. nothing. Isn't that weird? And nobody ever tried to like fess up to it later so far. I mean, no there's still time. Credit, if you will. Right. Yeah. Other than the Sons of Gestapo, which never was heard from again. <laughs> right. I guess I could do my sources. There's a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Okay. So IPSnews.net, NPR.org, UnsolvedMysteries.fandom.com. So this was an Ooh. Unsolved Mysteries episode as well unsolved.com, newyorktimes.com, cnn.com, latimes.com, deseret.com. Not desert, deseret. I was thinking Desiree, but Desiree. Oh, maybe it is Desiree. I don't no, know. maybe it is Desiree. I don't know. Who knows? archive.org, tulsaworld.org or .com, azcentral.com, unresolved.me, wikipedia and gbcnv.edu. Wow. Oof. Yeah, a lot of them. No resolution. Right. Still not the real question. The real question is, are they um, are they still doing beer runs? Good question. We'll have to see. We'll have to follow up with Pat. Pat is the biggest thing that happens out there still just beer runs other than the one train derailment. (laughs) Because that would be much, much less exciting and probably much better of a night. Oh, yeah. But yeah, they did figure out after that derailment, they changed some things. So it's not so I, easy I would to. Hope so. <laughs> yeah. To see images from this story, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ODFM Podcast or on our website at odfmpodcast.com, where you'll also find a link to our merch store where you can get awesome stuff like t shirts, mugs, stickers, and more. And if the weekly podcast just isn't enough to fill your ODFM cup full, join our fan club on Patreon for more content like minisodes, bloopers, and discounts at our merch store. That site is patreon.com slash ODFM podcast. And if you do love our bloopers and need more than we naturally do, which is a lot, buy us a glass of wine at buymeacoffee.com slash ODFM podcast. Thanks for listening to another episode of ODFM, hosted by Kelly DeVries and Jenna Swanson. Production and editing by Kelly DeVries. Theme music by Eric Swanson. ODFM is a satirical true crime podcast for entertainment purposes only. The stories you hear are serious and true. The comments and opinions are not. We apologize if any of our content is harmful or disrespectful.